This is Malay, a large finger of land extending from the coast of Indochina toward the islands of Java and Sumatra. A land rich in natural resources, rich in the vital metal tin. Tin is so highly essential because it is rust resistant. Tin, when mixed with lead, makes solder. Tin, when mixed with copper, makes the vital alloy bronze. Tin is found in England, Bolivia, China, and Africa. But the world's richest deposits are in Malay. And the most important of these lie in the Quinta Valley in the state of Perak. More than 300 years ago, Chinese prospectors discovered the wealth of the East Indies. By 1912, the Chinese accounted for nearly 80% of the tin ore output, even with their very primitive methods. But while these first pioneers were brave and adventurous, their methods were crude and inefficient, and they found the ore only in streams and rivers and on the surface of the ground. Today, other Chinese and European companies use the most scientific methods of getting the tin from the surface or from beneath the surface of the earth. Yet it is interesting to note how primitive means and the use of manual labor prevail. Before any large-scale modern mining is started, it is first necessary to determine if there is enough tin to justify the great effort and expense. A hole is drilled so that samples of the earth can be taken at different levels. The auger bit has penetrated the clay-like earth to a certain depth. A sample of this earth is taken. It will be carefully analyzed by a European engineer for its tin ore content. First it is washed. As the Chinese coolie woman washes or pans the sample of earth, the dirt and sand are swirled away while the heavier tin ore settles to the bottom. This method of separating the tin from other particles of earth by the use of water is one of the fundamental principles of tin mining. The process is again repeated by an assistant to the engineer who removes the sand from the top of the remaining ore. The sample of ore is then heated over a fire to remove the water and any impurities or foreign matter. Tin is a non-magnetic substance, so the analyzing engineer will use a small magnet to remove the magnetic waste products, another fundamental principle of modern mining. Upon weighing the remaining sample, he can then determine if the heavy element of tin is present in any particular stratum of the ground in great enough quantities to warrant a full-scale mining operation. When modern prospecting and analyzation reveal a heavy deposit of tin ore, several mining methods may take place. The simplest of these is called hydraulic sluicing. This method uses water under high pressure, which strikes with tremendous power when the deposit is found in a soft, sandy type of soil. Many square yards of earth are dislodged and washed down in a day by this progressive method. The wash is then pumped up to the ground level where it passes through several sluicing boxes. Across the bottom of these troughs are riffles or slats which catch the heavy tin ore permitting the lighter material to pass out the ends as waste. These are Malayan coolies women whose ancestors owned the land and who have continued to work here after it was sold to the mining company. Ore deposits found in a hard clay-like soil must be excavated mechanically or by manual labor. This is the second type of open cast mining. Too hard to be broken up by water pressure, the rock-like chunks of earth are transported to a stamping mill where they are crushed by machinery. The crushed particles are then mixed with water and pass through a vibrating machine, a process which permits the heavier tin concentration to be caught on the bottom while the lighter waste elements are carried away. While hydraulic sluicing and open cast mining are essential and peculiar to the type of soil containing ore deposits, the most productive and efficient method is that of dredging. Wastelands and jungle growth are first cleared and again employing the manpower of native labor in great numbers and using primitive tools combined with modern machinery, a gigantic excavation or paddock is first undertaken.
As the excavation is being dug, heavy machinery begins to arrive from many parts of the world. The dredge itself was first constructed in Scotland and then dismantled and shipped to Malay. These parts for the dredge have been built in England, Holland, Scotland, and America, and are then broken down and shipped to the East Indies, where they are taken through the dense jungle to be reassembled at the construction site. At the edge of the excavation, an enormous pontoon is built of prefabricated steel to support the superstructure of the dredge in the water. Indians, Chinese, and Malayans work side by side with European engineers on this huge project, all speaking a common Malayan dialect. Months later, when the pontoon and excavation are completed, water is admitted to create a man-made lake, and the great float is launched like a ship. Well built and evenly balanced, this massive pontoon must be capable of supporting thousands of tons which comprise the superstructure and working parts of a floating factory. The superstructure of the dredge is then constructed on top of the floating pontoon. This involves the highest skill of the European engineers down to the simple muscle power of the lowliest coolies in many more months of intensive work under a tropical sun. Then, after nearly a year of highly skilled effort and countless hours of sheer manpower, the dredge is finally completed. A mammoth floating factory that can dig its own excavation, extract and process the tin ore from the earth, and spew the waste products away like a monstrous digestive system. The most important part of the dredge is the front end, which supports a series of huge revolving buckets. These buckets can dig to a maximum depth of 130 feet. By this method, the dredge can handle over 15,000 tons of earth in one day. When in operation, the dredge often eats into the bank, digging its own paddock or lake as it goes, while the buckets scoop up the ore-bearing soil and carry it inside for processing. The buckets overturn at the top of the ladder and the contents pour into revolving screens called trommels, where high-pressure water jets thoroughly clean the sand from the stones. The finer particles of earth containing the ore are caught and retained by the screens while the waste material is carried away. The material is then carried through several processes where mechanical ingenuity and electrical power replace many human hands and primitive methods in separating the tin ore from waste products. The principle involved is one of gravity separation. Using water as a supporting agent, the pulsating machinery shakes the heavier tin ore free from foreign matter and allows it to settle to the bottom. This is fundamentally the same principle which the coolie woman used to get the first sample of ore by her panning method. Stones and pebbles, though larger in size, contain no tin and therefore remain on top, while the sand-like particles, heavy with tin, sink to the bottom and are later extracted. Thus, with the heavy tin ore remaining on the bottom of the processing troughs, stones, pebbles, and foreign matter are carried away and discarded at the rear of the dredge as waste. A magnetic separator is sometimes used in which the magnetic foreign particles are separated from the non-magnetic tin. This is the same fundamental principle that the analyzing engineer employed when he first sampled the earth for tin ore content. The non-magnetic tin particles, which are not attracted to the magnet, are retained, while the magnetic foreign matter is discarded. The particles of sand, which have settled to the bottom of the troughs, now contain the greatest amount of tin ore and are called tin concentrates. This is the last stage of processing on the dredge. The tin concentrates are removed from the dredge in buckets to a barge and are taken ashore for drying. The earth has thus been processed to a point where it assays from 75 to 77 percent pure tin. The tin ore is then washed for the last time and dried to remove all water, which reduces its weight and makes it easier to handle and ship. After dehydration, it is then placed in sacks and weighed. It is finally transported over rail to the nearest river or ocean port, where it is shipped to Singapore for refining and smelting. 
Thus, in the mining and production of tin ore in far-off Malay, European engineers, Chinese, Indians, Malayans, and Eurasians have worked in harmony to mine a natural resource of one country so that it may be used by the industries of the entire world. Into razor blades, bicycles, automobiles, water pipes, and food containers will go tin. For in any article that must be rust-resistant, tin will be present. Tin, in its various forms, is one of the world's most essential metals.